on the sleepy Canadian seaside resort of Prince Edward Island. In a former Catholic church, hundreds of people gather to see the man seen as leading an indigenous renaissance in Canada. The winner of the country's biggest music prize, opera tenor Jeremy Dutcher sings in Wallastocki, just one of Canada's 70 indigenous languages. Jeremy is just one of many artists reclaiming their heritage through his award-winning songs. They are reinterpretations of century-old wax cylinder recordings um, of people from my nation. So I come from the Wolostok people, uh, which means the people of the beautiful river. And we're an indigenous nation in what is called uh, today New Brunswick, Canada. We don't have any schools here in this country that are dedicated to, uh, to our language. I hope to see that change in my lifetime. Our language is at a very precarious place. We have less than 100 fluent speakers left. It's a language that listens to the land. And it, it transforms the way that I see the world. Incredible. I'm speechless. You just, you can feel his energy and his feeling in what he's saying. It doesn't matter that we don't understand what he's saying. Like, it's just, the emotion is there. This next song is called Aguidin. And in my language, Aguidin means canoe. And so this is a canoeing song. I'm going to play you first the um, archival recording from 1907. <laughs> The real sin was that Europeans showed up to this continent and they thought we had nothing to offer them, you know? They thought of us as subhuman, um, with no value in our languages and in our songs and in our ways of knowing. And so I think that is what I'm hoping to correct. The fact that there was a culture ban until 1951 in this country where it was, it was not okay for us to gather or to sing our songs or do ceremonies. And that's, so that's relatively recent history. Just to be here today and to know my language, to sing my songs, um, this is an act of defiance for the forces which wished us not here. What I think is important about this moment right now is that Indigenous people are taking our narratives back and we're telling our own stories, you know, in our own languages. Overwhelmingly, what I've found is that non-Indigenous Canadians and newcomers to this land feel ready to have bigger conversations about these shared histories that we have. There's a lot that gets lost when the language is lost. It's not just words, right? There's, it's the culture, it's the people, it's the spirit, it's everything. Music brings people together and it's a welcoming way to have real serious conversations about things that need to change. So here's my elder name, Maggie Paul, five years ago in that conversation that we were having. When you bring the songs back, you're gonna bring the dances back. You're gonna bring the people back. You're gonna bring everything back. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be just like when we, when we first started, we brought the music back, we brought the drum back. Sweat lodges are here, teepees are going all over the place. Wigwams, people are making wigwams. So we're at 
Gugog Island powwow. It's an annual powwow. It's one of the best powwows in the region. A powwow is equivalent to a festival, except it's completely indigenous. There's indigenous dancers. Uh, there's traditional teachings that are shared. There are always big drums, drummers in the center of the circle, and that's usually an, an arbored area. I am a woman's traditional dancer, and so oftentimes what you'll see in my style of dancing is a very sedate way of moving. Our feet always stay on the ground, so you'll see that my feet are moving rather slowly. Traditional practices like the Scugog Island First Nations powwow in Ontario were considered a threat by European colonialists who tried to stamp them out. In the Indian Act of 1876, Canadian authorities sought to subjugate and effectively erase indigenous cultures. Between 1879 and 1996, around 150,000 First Nations children were removed from their families and placed in residential schools, designed to make them forget their language and culture. Many suffered abuse. The system is now recognized by Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a cultural genocide. I'm a residential school survivor. I went through a lot of trauma and a lot of self-pity, and I was blaming everybody and feeling sorry for myself. I got mixed up with drugs and alcohol in the 60s and 70s, and then when I uh, went into treatment, I found this elder took me to a sweat lodge, and after that, I. Uh, because I went to a different churches looking for Jesus, looking for God, looking for the creators. I had a spiritual awakening because this is what I was looking for, this, uh, what we got here. And that's what saved my life, is this uh, spirituality, what we have here today. 1.6 million people in Canada's 37 million population are indigenous. Among them, one in six speak an indigenous language. Many of them, like Cree, Inuktitut and Ojibwe, are on the verge of extinction, largely because of what happened in Canada's colonial past. The government of Canada now recognises that it was wrong. Prime Minister Harper made a formal apology to the Indigenous peoples in 2008, reiterated by Prime Minister Trudeau nearly ten years later. The government of Canada sincerely apologises and asks the forgiveness of the Aboriginal peoples of this country for failing them so profoundly. Indigenous people have long since taken their healing and reclamation of their culture into their own hands by passing on their ancient ways to younger generations. We're here to celebrate life, we're here to enjoy this day, but we continue to work towards self-determination. So when we see these modern day warriors, that's what it is. It's that spiritual connection to the past, but it's also carrying us into the future. This is something that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. This is who we are. We are the first nation that we're here, and we're not going anywhere. Like I said, we're strong, and we want to keep that strong. Montreal, the Canadian city known for its bilingual culture of French and English. It's also home to one of the most acclaimed indigenous directors in the world. Honored by this city mural, 87-year-old Alanis Obamsarwin has made more than 50 films. This is my mother when she was a young woman in my community with a friend of hers. There is, is a picture of when on location, that must be uh, 47 years ago. 1960 was an important year 
because we were recognized as citizens of our country for the first time. From that, in 1961, I think, I was doing a campaign to uh, build a swimming pool in my community because our children were not welcome in the next door swimming pool. And someone uh, made a film on what I was doing. The film board saw that film, and that's when I was invited here. I didn't know anything about filmmaking at all, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> Did you have to fight um, to get films made in the beginning? Yes, and not only that, I had to raise my own money. Did you face a lot of opposition? Oh, my God, are you kidding? It's, you know, my name was really the savage. What's the biggest change you think that you've seen? First of all, the, the educational system changing very slowly, but uh, did change. All the films I make are used at all the university level and high school, and that's a very big change because it's really the voice of the people. Our people in all nations are very beautiful and they don't know it. When they finally see themselves and see each other on the screen, I think they're amazed. Filmmaker, singer, mentor, Alanis is also now a gallery artist. Her first solo retrospective exhibition recently took place at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, inspired partly by her childhood. Tell us a bit about growing up, where you grew up, what it was like. I went to school in a town. Uh, it's about 30 miles away from my village, but on the other side of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, we were the only family there. And, uh, the only indigenous family? Yes and it was pretty bad. There was a lot of racism. Yes. But you know, a couple of years ago, for the first time in my life, I was thinking, maybe I have to say thank you for the bad times. Because look what I did, you know? Maybe if, if I had an easy life, I wouldn't be here. And, and, and I'm lucky because I'm healthy, I can still work. I'm so happy to see what everybody's doing. And it's a very important time. Go. The pines are still when the police throw tear gas at the people standing there. Suddenly, the wind comes and the smoke turns towards the police and onto Highway 344. In support of the Kanisataki people, the warriors of Ganawagi block all highways leading into their reserve. Alanis's whole career has been an act of decolonialization. In her landmark documentary, Kanis Ataki, 270 Years of Resistance, she documented what's often referred to as the Oka crisis. She spent 78 days filming the armed standoff between the Mohawks who were fighting against their sacred ground being turned into a golf course and the police and the Canadian army. This is probably your most famous film and that you've made out of all of like 53 films. What was it like making that? Hell, <laughs> there was a war on and uh, there was no facilities. Like I was sleeping outside on the earth for weeks on end. But uh, I'm glad that I stayed. I saw so many people having so much courage and believing uh, in the reasons why they were doing the resistance and they were right. Why do you think this film then became your most famous? It's historical and it really became a turning point for all the nations in the country. Whenever there's a resistance or a, a fights with government, it always has to do with land and natural resources. In general, the people of this country, the Canadians, I had no clue really of this kind of problem that all the nations had. They've all been robbed of their land and some of them never got anything back. It's a shameful thing for the country. So I think our people are taken more seriously now. And I don't think something like that will happen again. 
And what do you think about the government's efforts to improve relationships, but also um, to support Indigenous culture and languages in Canada? Um, there's ups and downs, and uh, I think uh, right now we're going somewhere that I don't think we've ever been there before. You see big changes in, in their terms of thinking of us and uh, making their rules and their laws that we fight against. And Are you optimistic about Indigenous cinema for the future? Oh, yes. It's amazing what's happening now, and it's only going to be bigger and better as we go. Tucked into the heart of Montreal's botanical gardens, it's a First Nations garden, an outdoor museum honoring indigenous culture and plant use. At 25,000 meters squared, it's the largest garden devoted to the First Nations and in Inuit in North America. I think it's uh, absolutely important to have such a space in, uh, in Montreal. There's not that many spaces like this um, or indigenous spaces that, that are present in Montreal. So to have this First Nation garden is also a recognition that we are present, that we exist. Although there are more and more places devoted to indigenous culture in Canada, finding a place of belonging is something Algonquin French contemporary artist and filmmaker Caroline Monet has grappled with growing up. Unfortunately, I don't speak my language, uh, but that's a, a direct consequence from uh, residential schools and the cultural genocide that happened in Canada. My grandfather uh, spoke Algonquin, the Anishinaabemowin language, until uh, he was 10 years old and then sent to residential school. He came back to his family speaking English, but also with this sh shame of being uh, indigenous. And uh, in residential school, they used to uh, clean children's mouth with soap. So imagine growing, growing up with that and what it does to you and the, the shame that it brings to you. So um, my grandfather never taught his children and my mother doesn't speak it. But uh, now there's a revitalization of the language and uh, there's a, actually a program in Canada where I can relearn my language. It's really my responsibility to, I think, break the cycles of victimization from the past and really make the efforts and the dedication to learn my language so I can teach it, teach it to future generations. There are many dark subjects concerning Indigenous communities, residential schools, high suicide rates amongst young people, and the many missing and murdered Indigenous women. Through her sculptures, installations and films, Caroline Monet confronts these traumas head on, but she wants to change the narrative and break the cycle of victimization. So welcome to my studio. This is my space. We've been working on this kind of a futuristic costume. These are traditional Anishinaabe designs that are traditionally passed down through the matriarchs. So for me, it's a way to be inspired by tradition, but also transpose it into the future. You deal as well with lots of difficult subjects in your work, like residential schools. I can see here you've got a rubber that says yeah, so this Indian on it. It speaks for itself, basically, just to put the word Indian on an eraser. Uh, speaks about what's been happening in Canada uh, in the last century. It's been, you know, four generations that they removed us from our culture and our right to, to express ourselves, and maybe it's going to take four more to rebalance everything. But uh, I want to be part of that change and be part of that process. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite important to just speak it out. In 2019, what does it mean to be an Indigenous artist then? Being an, a, an Indigenous artist today means that you're really uh, kind of acting as a sociologist, acting as a politician, acting as an educator, acting as a researcher. It comes with a lot of responsibility, I find. So this is a building that we're, we want to cover in paint. So it's an old water fabrication factory, uh, which is really interesting to put these designs on that building because we know that many indigenous communities across Canada don't have drinking water. So it's almost a way of healing. I've been working with industrial materials a lot. 
And in 2015, this Truth and Reconciliation report came out. Mm -hmm. It was about residential schools um, and what Canadians and Canada has to do to improve reconciliation. And they actually called it a cultural genocide, what happened. Did that report change anything? Well, in terms of the recognition that it brings on a worldwide scale, it's very important because before that, it wasn't said officially that there, there were genocide in, in Canada. So just that step is, is immense. Canadians can no longer say that we don't exist. And what role do you think art has in the reconciliation process? It has a huge role. It's uh, very important. I think it's the base of everything. But... Because art is a place for dialogue and conversation and just to talk about ideas. If I make a piece of art, then I can engage in a conversation. I can propose something and uh, there's a physical response to the, either the object or the film or you know, the painting. Art has a much broader impact on society overall, I think. Dialogue seems to be the best way towards reconciliation. Together, Caroline and I travel downtown to Montreal's St. Gabriel Park for the Cinema Under the Stars Festival. The film being shown is History Telling, a short documentary where school kids in French Canada re-examine the story of colonialism. It's made by non-Indigenous filmmaker Guillaume Longlois. La mode de vie traditionnelle est menacée plus que jamais d'abord par l'invasion du territoire puis par l'obligation de de rester au village. Storytelling, c'est euh, une rencontre euh, au montage entre une classe de Chicoutimi, donc une classe euh, québécoise, puis euh, une classe euh, de Pessamit, une communauté inou de la côte nord. Donc, je voulais un peu présenter à travers euh, des, une, un questionnement sur l'histoire, notre point de vue sur l'histoire, dépendamment de notre identité. Euh, donc, je questionnais ça avec les enfants et les faire dialoguer au montage. Puis, une fois, ils ont découvert qu'en frappant deux pierres ensemble, bien, ça faisait un bord tranchant. Peu après leur arrivée, le climat commence à se réchauffer, ce qui amène la fonte de la banquise. Et comment avez-vous abordé le sujet? Parce que c'est un sujet très délicat ici, en, au Canada. J'y ai un peu échappé à la question de, de l'appropriation culturelle. Dans la mesure où j'ai proposé une rencontre, tu sais, je n'explorais pas, moi, euh, strictement la culture autochtone. Je proposais vraiment une rencontre en, en deux cultures. Donc, j'ai un peu échappé à cette potentielle maladresse-là. Il faut quand même toujours être, être prudent. Tu sais, je me suis conseillé, j'ai été bien entouré par l'école de Pessamit, la communauté Inuit, tu sais, qui m'a super bien accueilli puis qui m'a guidé avec euh, les professeurs tout ça, pour que l'expérience passe bien. Et ça a super bien été. Là, ils t'ont bien accepté, euh, les Inuits. Euh... Oui, oui, oui. Ben, tu sais, on dit que c'est un peuple rieur, fait ouais. que c'est clair qu'il y a eu beaucoup de taquinerie puis tout ça, mais oui, c'est vraiment... Ça a super bien été, oui, super accueilli. C'est ça, il faut toujours faire attention de la propriété culturelle. Nous, ça fait tellement longtemps qu'on n'a pas eu l'autorisation de s'exprimer que tout d'un coup, on a les moyens pour le faire. C'est sûr que c'est comme à notre, à notre tour de nous raconter nous-mêmes. Euh, donc, quand il y a des gens comme Guillaume qui le font de fa façon respectueuse, qui le font avec la communauté, mais c'est sûr que c'est bienvenu. C'est quand c'est fait sans demander permission et dans le manque de respect que là, ça, ça pose un problème. Et... Et ça perpétue, en fait, des idées coloniales. Vous avez vu le film en avance. Qu'est-ce que vous avez pensé du film? <rire> je t'écoute. Bien, moi, je pense que c'est un film important parce que l'éducation, c'est au cœur... Euh, c'est au cœur de nos sociétés. Et c'est, je pense, en ce moment, le sujet le plus important pour la réconciliation. Il faut éduquer les jeunes Québécois sur euh, la culture, dans ce cas-ci, nous, mais la culture autochtone en général. Un film comme ça, il est quand même important. Ma... Indigenous culture has been collectively shaping the fabric of Canada since Confederation. Whether you call it a rebirth, a renaissance, 
for reawakening. Artists, singers and filmmakers are leading the decolonialization movement, bringing Canada closer to a reconciliation with its past. Like those who came before them, a new generation of Indigenous people are rising up to reclaim their culture and their place in the world.